the reality is, in practice, the policy is we make the rules, we're the United States, we make the rules and we break the rules whenever we want to, whenever we can, when it serves what we believe to be our geopolitical interests. And a lot of different uh, messaging and media from the White House and Congress, as well as from US media and aligned media elsewhere in the world is, as you alluded to, when Russians bomb a hospital, that's terrible, which it is. When Israel bombs a hospital, which it has done many times in Gaza in the last year, that's, that's unfortunate. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I've got the great privilege of talking to a fantastic thinker of war, peace, and the forces that create both. I've got with me Norman Solomon, who is an American journalist, media critic, activist, and a writer. His latest book is a real masterwork and deserves a lot of attention. It's called War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine. And it comes on the heels of many other works, such as War Made Easy, How Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death. Mr. Solomon is also the founder and executive director of the Institute for Public Accuracy, a consortium of policy researchers and analysts. Mr. Solomon, welcome. Thanks very much. It's really good to be with you. Well, thank you for taking the time because you wrote this fantastic book and I've looked at the other works that you created and you are somebody who pays a lot of attention to media spin and the way that uh, war is sold to people, right? And in my analysis so far, I must say the United States is a master at creating narratives, very fluffy, cozy, lovely narratives around the worst thing in the world, which is war and killing people with massive bombs and ammunitions and so on. Um, can you maybe, to start with, tell us what are the main narrative tools that you also explore in your book that are used in order to sell war on a massive scale? Those master tool narratives are especially effective and pervasive in the United States. After all, it's the easiest sales job within one's own country when all sorts of nationalism and chauvinism can be mobilized consciously and more subtly. And so those tools uh, have to do with the inculcation from very early age, a lot of the assumptions that people have that the United States is the light on to the nations of the world. And that while sometimes flawed, the United States basically is a do-gooding country. And so the dominance of certain media outlets, plus the huge platform that presidents and members of Congress and cabinet members get, all of that is just very effective, although it's really difficult to sell something that over a period of time will upset people, will seem to be not what is advertised. And so just to sort of give an example, if there's the Gulf War in 1991, the United States wins in six weeks. There are, according to the Pentagon later, 100,000 Iraqis killed. That's a fairly easy sale to make that the war was a good positive thing. Whereas in contrast, the Vietnam War goes on for nine or 10 years. A lot of Americans die. There's no capacity to claim victory then the American public, despite the tools in the tool chest for propaganda, may well grow weary and in some of the avenues that do exist for democratic pressure, ultimately exert some changes in government policy. And the, I mean, the, the role of the media is obvious in this entire, in, in, in this in, 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 entire process but it's more than just the media isn't it it's also the way that that certain institutions like think tanks and the, the press secretaries and so on inter interlink and members of cabinet uh, um and and the uh, congress how the how they discuss these issues with the with the choices of words um, and we see that in every war 
sure that you have certain per, like very popular narratives, right, that then serve as an excuse and an explanation, most notoriously, of course, the weapons of mass destruction, and they get repeated so often. Can you maybe talk about these this singular events that, that then are used in order to basically sell everything that comes downstream? As you say, uh, an excuse and an explanation and ways in which repetition is so central to getting the message across. And I give an example. If one is an American watching a lot of television, you're not just going to see one McDonald's commercial. You're going to see a lot of them. And that's because those who are selling the Big Macs and so forth understand that the essence of sales, the essence of propaganda, you might say, is the repetition. So the occasional counter messages, even if they get through, are not going to be nearly as effective. And in every war that the United States has spearheaded, and there have been a lot of them, certainly in our lifetimes, there have been certain themes that are repeated again and again, as you say, uh, what turned out to be absolutely false, the supposed weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It's hard for the truth to catch up or make a difference even after it's been exposed as a falsehood of course, in that instance, as in so often the case, that's after the fact. It's too late. And I think it was Mark Twain who said, a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth gets its boots on. And it is the repetition. And just in my own lifetime, I'm in my early mid-70s at this point, the Vietnam War was sold that the communists in North Vietnam were uh, trying to overcome the South by force without certain facts being shared. And as Aldous Huxley has said, and I quote in the book, the silence can be the most powerful form of propaganda and deception. Silence is a form of lie. And so to distort the history of, of Vietnam was, or to simply omit the actual policies of the United States and before them, the French and for them, the Japanese, in terms of what was done to people in Vietnam was a way of saying, history doesn't matter. You don't need to know about it. All you need to know is that there are bad people there. We call them communists. And therefore, it's necessary to go to war. And then you just uh, fast forward when the United States moved beyond what was in a distasteful way dubbed the Vietnam syndrome, i.e., hesitancy to embark in a big war on behalf of the United States. But during the presidency of Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, gradually the United States military and political infrastructure began to, so to speak, get its feet wet again and to walk further and further into the depths of warfare. And so there was the U.S. invasion of the little tiny island of Grenada uh, based on a complete falsehood uh, that the medical students on the island were in danger. I've talked to one of them who, similar to many others, said that was that was false. Then 1989, the U.S. invasion of Panama, where a former cooperative partner with the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, Manuel Noriega, when he turned and flipped and was not so compliant to U.S. foreign policy, all of a sudden, the fact that he's a drug dealer becomes talked about, you know. Um, there was a lot during the 1990s about Iraq. Yes, the Iraq invasion of uh, Kuwait, bad thing. Certain things were made up, like a complete fabrication uh, that the Iraqi troops ripped babies out of incubators in Kuwait City Hospital. That helped gin up the momentum. Uh, but a lot of the omission against again, in terms of what is a gloss, a um, PR effort to make people feel good, not only about going into war, but feel good about it afterwards. And so according to the Pentagon, 100,000 people were killed by the US military in six weeks during the 1991 Gulf War. These were Iraqis who included those who were troops retreating from Kuwait, and a terrible phrase was used above them as they were going back to Iraq because they were being driven out of Kuwait. 
It was called a turkey shoot. They were treated like uh, just uh, birds on the ground in the uh, uh, airplanes, the helicopters and so forth of the U.S. military were, were shooting them down as they retreated. Then you go to uh, the uh, Afghanistan War, 1999 invasion or 2001 invasion, and very little um, culpability of anybody in Afghanistan other than Al Qaeda for the terrorist attack of 9/11, and then as as you've alluded to, Pascal, the mythical weapons of mass destruction in Iraq were the uh, main excuse for the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq, which is terrible results, hundreds and hundreds of thousands at least, uh, who died directly and indirectly in that war. And since then, we've had um, other narratives. And I think a lot of it is, is narrative. It's telling a story of we must go in and rescue. And it means so often we must go in and kill and kill because the idea is if you go in and kill enough people, you're going to solve the problem. But aside from or in addition to the slaughter that takes place routinely of many, many civilians and the cascading negative effects, the situation becomes worse as a result. That was true in Iraq and uh, the U.S. intervention in Libya basically uh, blew the fabric of the society apart. Yes, it was a, a dictator, Muammar Gaddafi, and yet the... Uh, so to speak, the metastasization of the conflict there has resulted in ISIS, uh, a collapse of the entire society in Libya. And we're still dealing, or people in the Middle East, I should say, are still dealing with the, the terrible consequences as a result. But the sad fact is, at the end of the day, even when the lies come out as lies and are exposed <clears throat> for everybody to see, everyone understands in the US, in Europe, that weapons of mass destruction were a lie. Everybody understands that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was a lie. Everybody understands that the these pretexts to go in are lies. There are, there are some of the wars where the lies are not quite as exposed, but in some of them, like very obviously, very blatantly, the incubator lie, and yet, the leaders of these wars are forgiven and rehabilitated. George Bush Jr. is now, you know, a, a funky old former president who draws pictures and is even, even back in mainstream media. Even the liberals forgave him and took him back in as in, ah, oh, you know, he had his mistakes, but at the end, isn't he cute? Which drives me to this very sad conclusion that the only war crime that gets you into prison or hung from the neck is losing a war. If you're the winner of a war, even if all of the crimes are exposed, you face no consequences. How do you explain to yourself that even after the fact that all of this is exposed, there are no, there are no more, there's no, there's no attempt of the US system to rectify anything or to, to, to apprehend those who lied under oath to Congress, <laughs> you know, it's just one of the top like crimes, even within the U.S. domestic system. Yet it has no the the the, the people who come later always will put a, a shielding like a hand in front of them, right? Even if they're from the other party. How how do you make sense of this? It's what's been called victor's justice. You get to put people on trial if you win. Uh, certainly at Nuremberg after 1945 uh, and the collapse of the Third Reich, there were trials that were appropriate. People were, were sentenced to life in prison or execution, as I recall, or whatever. There were no trials about Hiroshima or Nagasaki, where two atomic bombs were dropped, unnecessarily even in military terms, let alone the horrific moral transgression. Uh, the firebombing of Tokyo uh, in Germany, the firebombing of Dresden. These were war crimes, and it doesn't change the fact that there was no accountability because the winners won the war. And that's been, unfortunately, a pattern 
I say only partly in jest that uh, more than being a capitalist or a Marxist, I'm a Lewis Carrollist. If you look at the story of Alice in Through the Looking Glass, where she's talking to Humpty Dumpty and he's engaged in all sorts of double talk. And in exasperation, she finally says, But the question is, how can you make one word mean so many different things? And Humpty Dumpty replies, the question is, who has the power? That's all. And we're seeing that played out certainly in 2024, when you look at what is happening in the Middle East and made possible by the vast and continuing shipments of US military weapons and ammunition to Israel, the slaughter continues of civilians as we speak now for more than a year in Gaza and at will the United States also having now expanded its bombing into Lebanon. Now, just a few weeks ago, Leon Panetta, the former uh, head of the CIA, Director, CIA director, as well as former defense secretary, he made a statement with a CBS network interview. And keep in mind, this is in late September 2024, after Israel caused thousands of uh, pagers and walkie talkies to explode simultaneously in Lebanon. And um, Leon Panetta said that that clearly, he said unequivocally, was terrorism. Where's the accountability if the United States is arming Israel, a terrorist state? So there is no accountability in and of itself. And to make it worse, because the United States government is so powerful economically, militarily, all kinds of leverage that is exert, exerted on other countries, quite often there's a real hesitance from other governments to directly confront U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, and I mean, <clears throat> if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at Europe, the the way that Europe also follows the narrative from the U.S. it's 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 quite it's quite a ridiculous thing, which is why I think like Europe, all the European states and Switzerland included, and so on, they're just satellites or secondary and tertiary satellites. Uh, anyhow, but we don't need to go there. My, my the bigger question on my mind is. The current narrative also is essentially built around the idea that the US and the Western system is egalitarian and it is inclusive, it's equitable, it's it's beyond racism, right? Races have been integrated, we love everybody and everybody is accepted, the LGBTQ community is integrated into the US forces, we have all of these beautiful um, colorful bombs that then kill people equitably and <laughs> inclusively. Okay, but but we have experienced something over the last, I would say, three years where we have seen even TV commentators reacting very differently to refugees coming from Ukraine, white, blonde people, and people coming from the Middle East, um, brown people, black people, uh, dark hair people. And the other day, I saw a clip on um, where Barry Weiss is her name, I think. She was talking in a in a in a in a in a, in a show about about the the, Jew, the 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 Jewish or the Israeli cause, and what she did, and it finally dawned on me what this is about. What she did is she said, "Look, October seventh is to us what 9/11 was to you, and how is it any anyhow acceptable that we cannot react?" The way that you did. I mean, we. I mean, just think what 9/11 did and, and how many wars ensued. So obviously, we have the right to do the same. Israel must have the right to do the same. So in a sense, it's a really weird racist notion that the whites must have the right to kill others. And Israel's current indignation, to me, seems to stem from the idea that it cannot, that it ha doesn't have the right to kill the same number of browns and blacks as the US has done and that seems to shock them it's like but we are equal so we must be allowed to kill as many as you do you also notice this kind of implicit 
but deeply ingrained racism in, in the discourse about war and peace. It really struck me as I was working on writing the War Made Invisible book that I couldn't think of any people killed during the so-called War on Terror by the United States. I couldn't think of any of them who weren't people of color. Virtually all of those killed in this war on terror have been people of color and it's hidden in plain sight. And so when I think about have US major or other newspapers had opinion articles to that effect, pointing it out? No, it's actually a remarkable silence about something that should be right in front of us. Is it the on only factor? No. Is the US bombing countries because people of color live in them? No. But when the United States bombs countries where people of color live, that makes it easier that they are people of color in terms of initiating and continuing that warfare in the politics and media of the United States. This is just really fundamental. Uh, W.B. Du Bois, a uh, century or more ago, wrote about what he called the color line as the um, defining factor of the 20th century. Globally, it's certainly operative in terms of the 21st century as well. And then you look at, and this does uh, factor in, in terms of 9-11 and what has happened with Israel and Palestinians in the last year now, the day after the October 7th, 2023 attack on Israelis by Hamas, which was a terrible war crime, both the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations and the Israeli ambassador to the United States publicly said, this is our 9-11. And on the surface, that would just engender sympathy and solidarity and so forth. But the sinister aspect, and it became predictably a huge aspect, is that both President George W. Bush and the leaders of the United States and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the leaders of Israel took those events as a blank check, as a license to kill, with no expiration date. And that's what has happened just after 9-11 and now happening in terms of what Israel is doing in Gaza, increasingly in the occupied West Bank as well, also in Lebanon. And uh, we don't know if it's going to expand even further to, uh, to Syria, to Iran in any sort of uh, concerted way. This is uh, very insidious because it assumes a prerogative. And if you were to boil it down, it can be summarized as might makes right. So you, you take away all the, the fancy fluting and the uh, bric-a-brac and the uh, language and uh, oratory, and it does come down to might makes right, which is completely antithetical to what we would think of as some sort of global security and international law. I point out in the book that the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, for several years has traveled around the world and talked about the imperative of what he describes as a rules-based order. The reality is, in practice, the policy is we make the rules, we're the United States, we make the rules, and we break the rules whenever we want to, whenever we can, when it serves what we believe, to be our geopolitical interest. And a lot of different uh, messaging and media from the White House and Congress, as well as from US media and aligned media elsewhere in the world is, as you alluded to, when Russians bomb a hospital, that's terrible, which it is. When Israel bombs a hospital, which it has done many times in Gaza in the last year, that's, that's unfortunate. And the differential, this is the essence of propaganda, when we have two different layers, what I call in the book, layers of grief, tears of grief. 
where some people's grief really, really matters, and some is really pretty inconsequential. And in the grand scheme of things, in US media, and even more so in the top levels of the US government, whatever the internal beliefs may be, in terms of waving the flag and denouncing atrocities, when Ukrainians suffer, that is a horrible atrocity. And I, certainly I'm saying it is. When Palestinians suffer, it's a completely other narrative. It's too bad, we feel compassion, but not outrage, not a change in policy as a result. I wonder, I mean, this, this creates to people like us who look at acts and not necessarily at, at who commits the most system, um, but we try to, to bring the world into a complete whole. It, it insults us, right, when then these double standards and these double narratives are being created. Um, but they work. They work at least on a, on a big enough population in order to allow for the onslaught of this, right? If the one thing that changed the Vietnam War was actually the mass protests on the street, and it was that public opinion decisively uh, tilted toward um, against it, right? And we also see how currently mainstream media, that's why we are here, right? Not on the mainstream, we are on the alternative media, how the mainstream still is part and parcel of that manufacturing of consent machine. And we also see how the US government and European governments are actually scared and afraid of these alternative ways of talking about, about war and, and peace and about politics in general and call it fake news and call it conspiracy theories and so on and so forth because they cannot control the narrative anymore. Uh, last week. John Kerry was on a, I don't know if you saw that, but John Kerry was on a talk show and he literally said, we, well, we have a problem in the US. The First Amendment is kind of a roadblock to uh, to um, to govern because people can say whatever they want. And it's not that easy anymore as it used to be to create a common understanding of things. Um, where are you seeing that development going because the best chance we have of correcting the narratives is by doing this right and by having these alternative spaces but it seems to me that they're getting slimmer and slimmer and we've seen recently also crackdowns on social media um, to again like whip everybody in line what what are your expectations for this narrative control of the government i think of a lake that will perhaps have water moving in different directions at different levels. So at the grassroots, there's increasing opposition to, for instance, the US-assisted, US-armed Israeli war on people in Palestine. The polling is very clear, uh, not just young people, but overall, the US public wants an arms embargo on Israel. That's absolutely off the table in terms of the top leadership of the US government. And you use the word insult, which I think is quite appropriate in that the double standards are so extreme. What George Orwell called double think and newspeak can be understood by basic intellectual reasoning or common sense, so to speak, to be ridiculous and absurd and self-contradictory when we're told to accept it and be quiet and pretend that those contradictions aren't there, that is an insult. It's an insult to our intelligence. It's an insult to our humanity, really. There's a callousness that is gradually created and reinforced. And if we are told overtly, subtly, tacitly, by silences and by emphasis that some people's lives really don't matter, even if, or especially if the US government is helping to kill them, then there is essentially a process of, whether you call it spiritual, moral, ethical, psychological corrosion. So it's a constant to parallel the military war and the extreme US military spending, there's this sort of psychological war. It's a, a siege on people's uh, 
ethical uh, foundations. And the young people overall, in terms of if we're going to calibrate by percentage and look at activism in the United States have rebelled against that. Early this year, when the campuses erupted with mostly nonviolent protests, takeovers of university buildings, encampments, insistence that as students, they weren't just there to read books and talk about ideas, they were there to try to restrain their own government, helping to slaughter civilians in Gaza. And the response from many administrations, and we're not talking about just rural, supposedly uh, low academic places, we're talking about colleges like Columbia University in New York City. They cracked down hard, but they were back on their heels. They didn't know what to do and they didn't handle it very well. And they were sometimes um, outpaced or uh, they were outfoxed, out chessboarded. And so uh, they spent the summer these administrators, often in close uh, collaboration with their boards of trustees, their sometimes multi-million dollar donors, and they worked out a strategy. And here as we speak, uh, midway through the autumn of 2024, the crackdown is very uh, severe and students are being threatened with all sorts of things. There are campuses where protests are banned. Uh, Columbia University in New York you need ID to even get on the campus. It's a way to, to seal off hermetically almost this supposed uh, bastion of academic inquiry. And I think this is, this is an example of what happens when we scratch the surface of what is supposed to be a tolerant, liberal, by any definition, uh, democratic society of discourse. Maybe let's talk about this because certain things currently are changing, and 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 of course these protests in the U.S. on the on the campuses, which by the way inspired campus protests all over the world. And I, I must I must like commend these students in the U.S. who really give me back some some faith in humanity and then inspire others to actually follow along. I mean the U.S. has this capacity of leading also in civil society in very very positive ways. So. That was that was a fantastic thing to happen, and and the the crackdown is of course a sign of weakness, not a sign of strength. It's especially a sign of weakness of the narrative, and we see other cracks, you know, that we just haven't seen before, and not 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 necessarily directly connected to Israel and Gaza, but you know, the fact that Donald Trump is now um, is 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 under investigation by the <laughs> um, Department of the, uh, of uh, Justice. Um, We've never seen that before. Never before has a U.S. president been uh, uh, in front of a judge, right? And you can see how the Democrats are very afraid of the own of this of this um, example that they na they're now setting and are already preemptively accusing Donald Trump of wanting to do the same to them if he ever comes to power. So it seems to me that the internal structures currently um, are going through cracks that that could threaten the system. Is that just a, a <laughs> wishful thinking on my part or do you also see see changes that just like 20 years ago or during the Vietnam War we haven't had we, we didn't have these kind of moments when the system kind of I mean the different forces um, crack down on each other so hard well there's been you know periodically a lot of turmoil as you say during the Vietnam War there was excuse me there was a lot of uh, as the war went on a lot of conflict it was framed in terms of generational. One interesting thing I discovered just recently, if you look at the supposedly authoritative Gallup poll, we had uh, young people visibly leading the anti-war efforts, often very dramatically. But overall, young people supported the war in Vietnam more than older Americans, which surprised me. And when we think about it, it's partly, I think, because Older people had lived through one way or another World War II and the Korean War, and they understood that the wars were not abstractions. It's different now. Young people are more against the Israel war, for instance, than the older people. 
it, it's funny <coughs> though, you know, just a little insight from my channel because YouTube, Google shows us our demographics of the people it knows. And the majority of my viewers is in your demographic. It's like a 60 plus. That's the more than 50% or 60% of the viewership of my channel. So when it comes to this, uh, this media space, at least on YouTube, it is the older generation with whom these, the, the, these talks here seem to resonate more. But that doesn't mean that the younger generation is not also anti-war. They're just lingering around in different in different networks, I suppose. Um, do you think that we are getting closer to a point where where really the, the this narrative control is 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 breaking? Are we are we are we getting closer to a point where we can say like no, we can now distribute distribute anti-war messages more 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 easily? Well, I, I think it, it really varies uh, in terms of different avenues of communication um, and for, I think, a variety of reasons, going back to slavery, the demographic political proclivities in different states and regions vary really widely. And if I was in, say, southern U.S. states like Alabama, Mississippi, it's just much more militaristic, more racist less open to progressive thought. Um, there's no utopia anywhere in terms of progressive uh, commitment, but certainly where I live in the San Francisco area, it's a very different atmosphere. And so I think there are a lot of different layers. And to some degree, it's extraordinarily balkanized socially as well. And so we have what are called the culture wars that were not nearly as explicit uh, during the 1960s or 70s, I can remember it's just, yes, there were, you know, hippies and this and that, but there was very little turmoil about uh, reproductive rights and abortion. There was not nearly as much of a evangelical right wing power polit exerted politically. And uh, the 1980s began at sort of a sea change. So it's a real um, sort of swirl of different cultural, economic, political, and uh, military-minded um, aspects that are in collision. And we're seeing that right now with, as we speak, a complete lack of clarity as to even who's ahead in the presidential race. We don't know. It's probably a coin flip between uh, Trump and uh, Harris, and that's that's where we are. Yeah, I, I find this I find this also really interesting. I mean, I'm also losing the capacity to understand like what is currently going on because I can't believe anything anymore. I mean, either the New York Times because they lie obviously, and the things we see online, we need to be careful because even the people with the best intentions, like you and I, we might get things wrong, right? We might just misunderstand them, and then we naturally reproduce something that we misunderstood. I mean, not 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 out of bad intention, but it's really hard. So that's why we are we are going through a crisis of, of analysis, isn't it? Of sense making of the world. Um, how do you approach that when you when you when you look at the news? How do you try to discern what you can believe from what you can't? Well, it's a challenge. I mean, considering the sources and the um, proclivity of a particular outlet to only have certain kind of sources, and if you look at it in aggregate, there our most media outlets will have a fairly narrow range. And I think that's that's dangerous, especially because there's an overarching superstructure of media, which has a certain consensus. And within the consensus, there is a debate within narrow bounds. I mean, to give a couple of example, examples, uh, capitalism is good. I mean, that's just sort of a given and that the drive for profits is really good. And that it should not be questioned uh, that corporations have a responsibility to make as much profit as possible. Uh, another realm that we've been talking about is that the US government not only has the right, but the responsibility to work its way in the world and get its way as much as possible. Of course, trying to avoid war, but if necessary, going to war. This is very widely held, I think less so among younger people who've been radicalized and I think have gotten more clarity to see the US role in terms of aiding uh, Israel, for example. And 
So, I mean, there's there's no no gospel. I, I, I would never claim to be a font of uh, particular wisdom, except to say that we try to scope this out the best we can. And uh, the trend is basically going to catastrophe. On climate, for instance, to accept the status quo is to accept uh, cataclysmic climate change on the planet for all all beings. And so that's that's where we are. And so I think all conventional wisdom that that's okay, whether it's um, a matter of, uh, of fossil fuels, of not really enforcing strict standards of regulation and so forth, whether it is that it's necessary for the United States to modernize its nuclear arsenal, this is insane. Um, the United States, uh, Britain, uh, Russia, China, uh, France, even uh, three or four other countries with nuclear weapons, Israel, North Korea, it's already uh, omnicidal, omnicide being the destruction of almost all human life. And yet the United States uh, has uh, mapped out with its budgeting about two trillion with a T dollars in the next 25 years under the euphemism of modernization to uh, retool its nuclear weaponry. That's conventional wisdom that it's that it's OK. Yeah. Yeah. And we know we know the impact of the military industrial complex on this decision making because it's a revolving door and they all give each other a lot of money. And it's really I mean, this all has been mapped out. What fascinates me, though, is that you have conflicting beliefs in society, which I think are both very important. And let's just take the one of uh, of the media. Because these conflicting beliefs, I still don't understand how in society you make them work together. One is that the media, the, the, the newspapers, exist to hold the powerful to account, right? And the Washington Post's motto of um, truth, uh, democracy dies in darkness. Yes, democracy dies in darkness. They, they adopted that after Trump came in. Yeah, they have that. They have that there, right? And it's so cute. It's so sweet. But then at the same time, those same people become stenographers of what they're fed. And in your book, you beautifully show like uh, Jen Psaki and so on and all of the, the White House uh, press, uh, uh, press um, uh, what are they called? The, the, the speakers. Yes, right. um, how they lie time after time. And when, it, even once, even, there's a little bit of pushback from the media corp of the of mainstream media, they immediately get angry and they tell you, well, do you believe us or do you believe the terrorists? I right. mean, do you want to believe your government or the terrorists? What are you? Where is this coming from that at the same time, this then seems like a patriotic thing to do. The patriotic thing is to believe my government while you also know that the press should hold them to account. How do you make sense of this? Well, the, um, the Senator J. William Fulbright, who became a dissenter against the Vietnam War in the mid-1960s, wrote a book called The Arrogance of Power. And that's a very apt phrase because people in power uh, gain arrogance and the centralization of power is a huge hazard for all kinds of crimes and deceptions. The great US journalist I.F. Stone said, all governments lie and nothing they say should be believed. And he wasn't saying that every government lies all the time uh, or that governments, each government lies to the same degree or consequence. But he was saying that governments, all governments at one time or another, to whatever extent, for whatever consequences, they deceive. That's part of the job. It's, uh, it's the uh, perceived, self-perceived responsibility. And I'm not saying this to trash government because I think the idea of democratic government is very, very important. And in contrast to corporations, which by definition are undemocratic, they have no interest in democracy whatsoever. It's up to the people on the boards of directors. That, that's, as the saying goes, that, that ship has sailed. There's no democracy in a corporate concept, whereas governments have the potential, and some of them have actually very important aspects of democracy, which are under assault by those very entities, those corporations, that are antithetical to democracy and the restraint from the electorate, from the people, if you will, 
is not looked upon kindly by those who want to make a whole lot more money and profits for their shareholders, for their, their stakeholders. Um, I forget the name of the company that ran, runs Fukushima in Japan. Uh, 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 TEPCO, Tokyo okay. Elec um, yeah. Electrical Power. Well, I, mean, I mean, they they lied. They're, 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 they saw their job to lie. Well, I mean, you can fast forward backwards several decades in 1979 when the Three Mile Island nuclear plant had a very severe accident. The governor lied. The utility lied. They, that was reflexive. In 1986, with the uh, meltdown at Chernobyl in Ukraine, terrible. And uh, the Rush, the Soviet government lied, the authorities there. That's just what they do. That They consider but that to be their jobs. The counter argument then is always, look, if every once in a while we might have to bend a little bit what actually happened, but we do it to protect you yeah, <laughs> because right. you little lamb need so much protection because you're too dumb to understand how the world really works. We understand it, so we we bend reality to protect you. It's in your best interest, and it's for the national interest, national security. Yeah, well, the sociologist C. Wright Mills calls it crackpot realism. And it's the men, usually men, who ostensibly know best, who lead us into one catastrophe after another. Uh, the journalist David Halberstam wrote a book about those who escalated the Vietnam War, and he titled it The Best and the Brightest. I mean, they didn't go to some uh, you know, college that is in uh, not in high regard. They went to Harvard, they went to Yale, they went to the top, ostensibly top Ivy League schools. Um, and just having a highly tuned intellect guarantees us nothing at all. It's about values. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr described what he called, how did it go? He, he said, uh, guided missiles and misguided men. And so we've got plenty of those people in charge of, uh, of governments around the world. And correct me if I'm wrong, but my personal experience is that it's not a matter of, of academic, academic exposure that determines whether somebody reasons well, not just like what they know, but how they think think I have so many friends who never even went to to college and who think well they're logical beings that can that also see the world and 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 um, and manage to 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 see the contradictions and then at the same time I know academics who are so completely engulfed in what they're doing that one of them recently told me you know um, I'm just a humble New York Times reader um, <laughs> And that sentence alone told me that, okay, I, I think you, you might believe too much. <laughs> but yeah, there's, yeah. there's others who are highly critical. Well, what, I, what is I, that I capacity? Say, I think academic background and wisdom, so to speak, those are independent variables. And we, we really know very little uh, about the, if you will, mor morality or cogency or even logic. Uh, part of it is the question of privilege it's really difficult to give up when you may lose some of your privilege by being more logical, so to speak. Uh, one way to put it is you, it's hard to bite the hand that signs your paycheck. And I acknowledge now paychecks are often generated electronically, maybe they're not signed, so the metaphor may not be as good as it used to be, but this is definitely true of journalists where, and I've noted this, that there are a lot of U.S. journalists at the most esteemed media outlets. When there's a war, they go to the war zone. They're very brave. Some of them are wounded, occasionally even killed. And then they get home and they go back to the newsroom and they're afraid of their top editor. The professionalism is equated with rising through the ranks. And it is a, as I document in the book, it's really a reputation and career dead end if you're going to challenge what is considered to be um, the proper outlook on US foreign policy, if you're covering foreign policy. 
and very few journalists buck the tide in a major way. There's 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 quibbles that go on, but quibbles don't challenge the basic prerogatives of the US government to wage war and try to do whatever it can, frankly, to manipulate events around the world. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many sociological mechanisms like kicking in that then manage to steer these groups of people, right? Maybe a, a last one that I that is quite dear to me also in regard to the name of this channel. Um, there is also this whenever whenever new wars start and, and, and also like then drag out, there's time and again that idea that it's with us or against us. I mean, George Bush Jr. even literally said so. But you see it come up again and again. It's like, you know, you have to pick a side. And mm -hmm. this is something that's going to change now because with this new multipolarity that we are in and the, the, the strength of the global south to just not go along but still matter in terms of like in economic terms but also military terms and so on. This is a new factor. And this is something I call, you know, neutral when you have your own position. Not neutral in the sense of not doing anything but not doing what the other two bastards out there tell you to do. Um this, but this, there's a psychological factor, right? The with us or against us. Do you have any thoughts on this one of how this works in the in the U.S. system that that you're able to whip up anything that that's not for you as must be against you? Oh, very much. Uh, right after 9/11, President George W. Bush said, "You're either with us or against us." Sometimes, some who would be a bit critical, they would go to the dictionary and say, "That's Manichaean." It's dividing the world up into the good and the bad and the evil and so forth. And I think there's been a resurgence of that in a lot of the parlance in US media and politics because of the Cold War, because of, and this came before even the US uh, uh, condemned the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And so then Russia's evil, we hear a lot about, it's, it's not uh, in fashion anymore to say axis of evil, that was 20, 25 years ago, but we hear that it's North Korea, China, Iran, and Russia. And that's a very comforting concept, uh, except it doesn't really deal with the real world. It just says we don't like them and they're in our way. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, there's the whole idea that China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia all have the same geopolitical interests. It's sort of silly, but it works through the lens of, again, you're with us you're, or you're against us. You think back 40, 50 years or so, and there emerged what was called the non-aligned movement. Even France got into you know, trouble in terms of US media and politics because uh, you had Charles de Gaulle and so forth and others in France a bit later, and they didn't want to line up. I think it was Chirac, the head of uh, France, who was not, the French government was not uh, aligned with the Russian, uh, no, with the US invasion of Iraq. So we're talking 2002, early 2003, uh, the French president says, I don't think the US should be invading Iraq. And there was rage in the United States. As a matter of fact, there was a congressperson who got the cafeteria at the US Congress to change the name from French fries to freedom fries. That's how outraged they were. Uh, his name was Walter Jones. He was a actually a conservative, and he later apologized when he realized that this war on Iraq was so horrible. And I think that's to a large extent where we are now. And the in terms of the propaganda uh, dominance of so much messaging in the U.S. and unfortunately, uh, because of what has happened after October seventh, twenty twenty three, that has been reinforced now. Uh, in U.S. media and politics. And it is absurd to claim that Israel is somehow on the quote-unquote good side when Israel is engaged by many definitions, not only in ethnic cleansing, but in genocide in, in Gaza. Things are really, um, things are really sort of topsy-turvy, as you've alluded to earlier, and there's an expression in the music world among blues musicians who say, you may feel you're getting lost, but you won't if you know the blues. And I think in terms of trying to sort out the events and the best or most important values to pursue on this planet, 
if we have a consistent single standard of human rights, that's the path to take. Otherwise, it all gets crazy and the cross currents of propaganda will just blow off, off blow us off course. Yeah. And not and not no, not the abused human rights discourse, which is like implement our human rights or we bomb you. But the real human rights, which is actually something that that a lot of countries, especially in the global south, want. I mean, African states are quite champions of developing human rights standards um, and also of de developing mechanisms. So this is something a lot of people want. I mean, the international law is something a lot of people want, especially in smaller countries. The problem is that there's 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 always a way of abusing certain concepts, especially when you have two of them, right? You have the right of self-determination and you have sovereign right. And then whichever currently fits your your needs, you take it. In the case of Kosovo, uh, you know, uh, self-determination overrides the sovereign right of Serbia to, go to govern its, its, its uh, territory. In the case of Ukraine, the sovereign right of Ukraine overrides the, the, the self-determination of the Donbass. No, so this no, pick no, and no. choose mentality is something that needs to stop. Oh, abs ab absolutely. And it, when you refer to Kosovo, you're reminding me in 1999, when the US led NATO bombing of Yugoslavia and Kosovo went on for, I think it was 78 days, if I remember correctly, President Bill Clinton at the time he gave speeches, including at Arlington National Cemetery, and he categorically said, the United States stands firmly against ethnic cleansing. We absolutely cannot tolerate it. And if ethnic cleansing is going on, we have the responsibility to go to war to end it. You fast forward to this year, the United States is arming the Israeli government that by any definition, has been continuing with massive ethnic cleansing uh, in the West Bank and now in Gaza. So it gets us back to Humpty Dumpty and Alice in Wonderland, where allowing or enabling or endorsing the idea that a word can mean anything you want it to at any time, it just uh, brings us down into a, uh, a spiral of demagoguery and really psychologically something close to madness the alternative is to say, you know, we're we're not here to propagate propaganda. We're here to have a single standard. Yeah, and we're and we're and, and we're here to kind of make make it work for everybody and not just for for a few, right? And that's that's a struggle humanity has been having forever. Absolutely, absolutely, and the elites and of course class issues in the United States, let alone globally, are just ones the U.S. media are not mass media not very interested in. I mean, there's been more willingness to talk about racism, not nearly enough, uh, but systemic racism. We hear nothing about systemic militarism from the US mass media, and really nothing about uh, systemic class bias, which after all, uh, is a matter of life and death for so many people in the US, let alone around the world. You're absolutely right. And this is what we should discuss more about, but we are running out of time. Um, I hope we can do that in a second talk in the, in the near future. But I would like to thank you, uh, Norman Solomon. Everybody go check out his books. Um, you find them on all of the uh, the popular um, bookstores online or uh, in, in, in real. Um, Norman, any, any place where people should go to follow you, Twitter or any social media? Oh, well, uh, people are welcome to just go to my website, normansolomon.com. And also they can find out more about War Made Invisible by going to the website, warmadeinvisible.org. And Pascal, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much for that. And see you next time, Norman. Thank you. Thank you.